All right, hello, future doctors. Welcome, welcome. So, are you ready for a super fast, super high yield revision of the plant kingdom? We're going to tackle this chapter, you know, completely from a neat point of view. Let's do this. Let's get started. Okay, so let's be honest. The five groups of the plant kingdom algae, bryophytes, pteridophytes, gosh, gymnosperms, angiosperms it's so easy to mix up their features, right? I know, it happens all the time. But don't you worry, thick or not. In just the next few minutes, we're going to clear up all that confusion, like for good. Let's dive right in. Okay, first up, section one, algae. Let's call them the panica plants. You know, we're starting with the simplest group. These are the real kings of the water, where the whole story of plant evolution really begins. So first question on the board. What are the main features of algae that are, you know, super important for NEAT? What's so special about them that sets them apart from the other plants? All right, let's check out the key points. First, their body is simple. It's staloid. What does that mean? Basically, no true root, stem, or leaves. Super simple structure. They've got chlorophyll, of course, so they make their own food. That makes them autotrophic. And, as you'd guess, they're mostly aquatic. Now, listen up. This is the NEAT alert. The main plant body is the gametophyte. And what does that mean? It means it's haploid, or N. You have to remember this. Okay, moving on to a really, really high-yield topic, the three classes of algae. You know you get those direct matching questions from this part in need all the time. So the big question is, how do we tell them apart based on their pigments and their stored food? All right, let's just run through this table really quick. It's super simple. Look at chlorophyce, the green algae. What pigments? Chlorophyll A and B. And what's the stored food? Starch. Easy. Next, pheophyce or brown algae. They have chlorophyll A and C, but the key one is fucoxanthin. That's what gives them that brown color. And their stored food is mannitol and laminarin. Got it? Finally, rhodophyce, the red algae. They have chlorophyll A and D, and the special pigment is phycoerythrin. Erythro means red. See? So that's why they're red. And their stored food is Floridian starch. See? Super logical. Okay, so we're climbing up the evolutionary ladder from algae. Next stop, section two, bryophytes. You probably know them as the plant amphibians. Now this question, oh man, this is an absolute favorite for the NEAT exams. Why on earth are bryophytes called the amphibians of the plant kingdom? Seriously, if you get the logic behind this, a whole bunch of other concepts will just click into place. It's that important. And the answer is, well, it's actually pretty simple. Think about a frog, right? An amphibian. It lives on land, but it absolutely needs water to reproduce. Bryophytes are just like that. They live in the soil on land, but, and this is the key, for fertilization to happen, they are completely dependent on water. Without water, there's just no reproduction. Simple as that. So just like an algae, the main plant body here is also the gametophyte, you know, the haploid end stage. It's the green part you see. It's photosynthetic and totally independent. But here's where it gets interesting. We now have a sporophyte, which is diploid or 2N. But this sporophyte, it isn't free living. No, it stays attached to the gametophyte for all its nourishment. It's completely dependent. That's a huge point to remember. All right, let's move on to the next major stage in evolution. We're talking about the first true land warriors. Section three, pteridophytes. So what was their secret weapon? What did pteridophytes have that bryophytes didn't? What was their single biggest evolutionary advantage? And here it is. This was the game changer. For the first time ever in the plant kingdom, we see vascular tissues. You know, xylem and phloem. This is like the plant's plumbing system. Because of this, they could also develop true roots, stems, and leaves. And now for the big one, the major neat alert. From this point on, the main plant body is the sporophyte. The diploid 2N stage is now dominant. That's a massive shift in the story. Okay, there's one more super important concept with pteridophytes. It's called heterospory. Let's just break that word down. Hetero means different. Spory means spores. So it's the production of two different kinds of spores. Small microspores, which are male, and large megaspores, which are female. Now, why does this matter? This is a huge neat point. This development is a precursor to the seed habit. It's the first step towards making a seed. And you absolutely have to remember the examples, Salvinia and Selaginella. Okay, let's keep moving up. The next level of evolution is here. We are now officially entering the world of seed-bearing plants. And we start with section four, 
gymnosperms, the naked seeds. The name itself tells you almost everything you need to know. Gymnos means naked and sperma means seed. So the question is pretty straightforward. Why are they called naked seed plants? And here's why. It's because their ovules are not enclosed inside an ovary wall. They're just out in the open. So after fertilization, the seeds that develop are completely exposed. They're naked. And because there's no ovary, guess what else is missing? Fruit. Gymnosperms don't make fruits. And finally, we arrive at the most advanced, the most successful, the most widespread group in the entire plant kingdom, section five, angiosperms. We can just call them the pool wale plants. These are basically all the flowering plants you see around you every single day. So what's the big upgrade here? Let's compare them side by side with gymnosperms. In gymnosperms, the ovules are naked. In angiosperms, they're safely enclosed within the ovary. Because of that, gymnosperms have no fruit formation. But in angiosperms, that ovary develops into a fruit. And the most obvious difference of all? Gymnosperms, no flowers. Angiosperms, they are literally defined by their flowers. All right, team, that's all five groups covered. Now it's time for the grand finale, a quick comparison of the whole kingdom that's going to tie everything together perfectly. Take a good look at this. This is your neat master table. Just follow the trends. Look at the main body. Gametophyte, gametophyte. Then bam, sporophyte, sporophyte, sporophyte for the next three. See the shift? Vascular tissue. Absent, absent. Then present, present, present. It starts with pteridophytes. Seeds. Absent, absent, absent. Then boom, present from gymnosperms onwards. And maybe the most important trend, water for fertilization. Yes, yes, yes for the first three. And then no, no for the advanced groups. This single table, seriously, is pure gold for your last minute revision. So after all this, what's the big picture? What was the most important evolutionary shift we saw? It's really two things, isn't it? The switch in dominance from gametophyte to sporophyte and the journey to freedom from water. That's the whole story. Those are the two trends that allowed plants to conquer the land. You're gonna remember that, right? Awesome. All the best for your exams.